as countries in the Great Lakes ramp up their firepower. It has raised the specter of war that could return to haunt the volatile region. Although conflicts in the Great Lakes tend to be intrastate due to strong cross-border dimensions and transnational ethnic identities, these conflicts have often spread to destabilize the whole region. Given the frosty relations between Rwanda and Uganda and Burundi and Rwanda, there are fears that a prevailing arms race could turn the region into a tinderbox. How the two leaders, Presidents Kagame and Museveni, have handled it. In other words, there seems to be a tension so much deeper than we can see, but which has been kept kind of quiet. It almost is like an intelligence war between the two countries. It's put quiet in the shadows, but you don't see it visible in troop deployments as it used to be between, let's say, Presidents Idi Amin and Julius Nyerere. But this back and forth, all these allegations of Rwandans being arrested in Uganda, when the Rwandan foreign minister openly at a press conference in Chigali tells Rwandan citizens, you know, you, we, you can travel to Uganda if you want to, but we don't guarantee your security. When you say that of a friendly, or at least a neighbor, neighbor and you say your citizens, with the backdrop of the 1990s genocide, you say the country that helped you people essentially at the last minute try and put an end to the genocide, you say Rwandan citizens are not safe in Uganda. That's what he said at the press conference. What else don't you say at the press conference? So there's that very serious tension. It's like relations at their worst, I guess, ever over the last 25 years. I think it's not going to improve because Rwanda has continued the, the closure of its border. And the trouble is that uh, the heads of state are not talking. What I have read the Minister of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs, Sam Kutesa, saying, will even make the situation worse. He says he's now telling Rwanda to stop provoking Uganda because they had kept quiet. And that's what Kagame said, that we don't have to be friends, but let everybody mind his business. And, and, and I take that advice. Uganda should mind its business and leave Rwanda. Otherwise, this, this continued quarreling will even one day cause us a, a, a war between ourselves, which is unnecessary. According to data released by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, an independent global security think tank, East Africa's military spending rose by $200 million last year to $2.9 billion in total. Kenya, which is trying to secure its borders and stamp out terrorism as the Al-Shabaab insurgency rages, spent $1.9 billion on the military. This expenditure accounted for 36.5% of the region's total of $2.98 billion. Uganda's spending rose by $62 million, hitting $408.4 million from $346.8 million the previous year. Uganda only provided $10 million to the African Union mission in Somalia. Tanzania, whose expenditure has been modest in the past five years, registered a marked increase of $64.3 million on the strength of new Airbus helicopter purchases, where Rwanda had a marginal rise in its defense spending to $119 million US dollars from $115.7 million. Earlier on this week, Uganda's Defense Minister Adolf Mwesige revealed that 56% of the defense budget will go to the classified expenditure vote, which will be spent on the purchase of weapons. And uh, consequently, UPDF capacity and capability have continued to grow in order to meet the current needs, sustain the peace and security which is prevailing in Uganda. And I think members can see some of the equipment which we have acquired uh, as a result of prioritizing classified expenditure. So classified expenditure is not just for the sake of it, but it has actually been used to equip the army in order to sustain the peace and stability which we have. Uganda's position in the region has been viewed with both prize and suspicion. As a troubleshooter, there are those who believe that the Kampala regime does not need to wait for a shooting war at its doorsteps before it intervenes. It is what the exponents of this doctrine believe prompted the UPDF to deploy in South Sudan 
to shore up the fragile regime of Sarvakir, who was on the verge of losing power to Riak Machar's reneging officers in 2013. It was our capacity that we stepped in. We stepped in for a reason. He's a neighbor. Secondly, it's our international market. We're getting a lot of money from these guys. So if you don't spend in anticipation of such occurrences on the neighboring states, and then also we're looking at if you don't step in, I'm not saying we should always be a, uh, an aggressive country. No, we can only do it as long as it fits our national interests. But then, as I said, because of all these shifting alliances and conditions, and we haven't had as much exposure to terrorism incidents in the last five, six years as Kenya, but people like the, the President of the who are experienced in guerrilla warfare know it doesn't take much. At a strategic level, Uganda depends on South Sudan as a buffer against Khartoum, which has often had a hostile policy towards the Kampala regime. With the ever-evolving face of conflict in the Great Lakes and the threat from terrorist groups affiliated to global jihad networks, some experts argue that Uganda does not need to be caught unaware. Our military was able to strike uh, ADF bases without crossing the borders. See, that was the beauty of buying those capacities. In the jungles of the Democratic Republic of Congo, an old insurgency may have a new trajectory, giving rise to the possibility of ISIS expanding its global conflict there. On April 18th, the Islamic State claimed its first attack in the DRC, claiming they had established a new caliphate in Central African Republic after striking a new location in Beni. ISIS attributed the attack to its affiliate, the Allied Democratic Forces, a Ugandan rebel group. In this picture, ISIS leader Abu Bakri al-Baghdad is seen receiving a report on the activities of the Central African Caliphate. An image published in issue 179 of weekly ISIS newsletter and released on April 25, 2019 shows the Islamic State Central African Province militants in DR Congo. A report by the Congo Research Group published in November 2018 suggests that the ADF has undergone a radicalization with a shift in the rhetoric employed by the movement from a war against the Ugandan government to a broader struggle for Islam. However, others argue that the threats against Uganda are amplified. Some experts argue that Uganda's defense expenditure is anchored on the country's brinkmanship policy in the region. With the ADF and LRA fighting abilities diminished, some experts say that this expenditure should have been halved and the rest of the funds distributed to vital sectors like health, education, agriculture and tourism. One would have hoped that all the regimes within this region would be working closely together to de-escalate the conflict situation so that it would enable them to make savings in the defense area. They are not doing that. And they, once you have got uh, potential conflicts, and more so if there are no efforts to uh, stabilize or resolve the, um, the possible conflicts, and therefore it gives you um, comfort to know that you don't have an immediate enemy, potential enemy in the, in the vicinity. If you don't do that, then inevitably you are forced to keep on investing in uh, weapons. Now the only way that can be turned around is if you have uh, an organization, in this case a party or a coalition of parties whose thinking is different who would go in and the first thing that they would do is to go into conflict resolution to ensure that there is comfort within the region, that nobody is uh, scared of the other. Some opine that Uganda has not relented on its aggression and barely learnt any lessons from the DRC misadventure. The other area of concern is the question of transparency in regard to the classified expenditure. With an election in 2021, there are fears that the money could be diverted. In, in the developed countries, what they do, they get uh, uh, committees which have access to even defense expenditures, even the classified form. 
I mean, there are also committees which are able to uh, go into intelligence uh, operational areas. What they do is that uh, they vet the members who are able to sit on committees of that nature. And they give them high classification in terms of uh, security clearance. And that can also be done here. If parliament can exercise its powers, for instance, the internal, the internal, the internal affairs and defense committee can demand for that. And they put a select committee under that to, to, to be able to monitor. You can't even be sure that that money is really going into defense because there's a high possibility that since we are moving towards the election, that the money which is going into uh, classified expenditure could most likely be also channeled into politics. It can't be a coincidence that every time you are nearing the elections, there will be procurement of a classified asset. And because those assets are never going to be declared, because they're going to tell you they are classified in nature. So it is intentional. Uh, the last time we did a surgery, we did a scrutiny of how the president spends money. For every district outreach, he needs 2.4 billion. For every district outreach, for every district delegation that he meets, he needs 560 million shilling. Every day you see him now on the road. He has started what he has called poverty, alleviation, that is touring the whole country, of course campaigning. So he needs that money. And the only way you can get that money is through classified expenditure because nobody is going to ask you for accountability. So you are almost accountable to no one. So that's why the budget of defense is going up. Can the parliament play its part as a legislative policy making body so that it gains the confidence of the government? Because the civil society definitely they have got reason, definitely the opposition has got reason. Why is defense ex uh, classified expenditure? You are touching on the public money, but you don't want people to know. You see, so government should be like um, uh, the, 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 the parliament should exercise its powers to ensure that the money that is appropriated for defense and classified expenditure is not abused. It should do the work it has been allocated to do. Yes, there has been issues of like, where opposition says, if you give a classified expenditure, some of the money will come to be used to, uh, to, to curtail our freedoms. To It's a valid point. True. But then one would ask, do you need a military helicopter to stop uh, a, uh, a valid? Procurement of, of ammunition is not a secret matter. Rwanda knows how much equipment we have and you know, because we all go to the market. When we are buying jets, everybody knew, including the seller. So there is actually no, no classified asset because every single thing you buy from the market, people will know who has bought what because they are regulated. You don't sell to everybody and that's why there will be an arms embargo and you will know South Sudan is not allowed to buy the following items. So this is just a one way of, of, of getting money to do politics, but through defense and security. That Uganda will fold its hands and watch its neighbors purchase superior arms without going into the market. Yet Uganda and her neighbors have the ability to de-escalate conflicts by forging alliances to root out the common enemy in safe havens. Emmanuel Mutaiziwa, NTV.